gentlemen, uh, we had to cancel men's retreat, if you didn't hear. Men's retreat got canceled. Uh, small important detail, there's no water. And the guys are like, I wasn't going to take a bath anyways, <laughs> right? I thought this was men's retreat. Okay, so a brief review. Uh, and by the way, welcome everybody online, including Rob. Rob, thank you for your uh, thoughts this week. I'm going to read a little bit of that in a second. So basically, the book of Galatians, the churches that Paul founded in the region of Galatia, named after who? Galatia, the Gauls. Isn't that just fascinating? Anyway. They've come under the influence of the Judaizers, and these are Jews who have received Christ as Messiah, but believe that there is a need to mix the old traditions, right? Uh, the whole law and basically circumcision. And, um, but most importantly, it seems like really what's going on is two things. They are, what their great fault is, is they're, re, they're telling the Gentiles it is required of them. In fact, even as I put in my notes last week, because I discovered it last week, it was this idea that first you become a Jew, like a full Jew, circumcised in everything in the law and everything, and then you can become a Christian. And also, some perhaps were also teaching that you maintain your salvation through the ceremonial laws and things like that. But our good brother Rob Ortheim, who is watching right now, well, not right now, but he will be watching tomorrow night. Yeah, so, hi Rob. Uh, our brother, he's our Jews for Jesus missionary. He's the one who leads us through Christ in the Passover every couple of years or whatever. But he watches every Tuesday night. And so he's sort of my, um, my Jewish check, you know. <laughs> and, um, and he had some thoughts about uh, from last week. So I'm just, Rob, I'm just going to read what you wrote to me. And this is what Rob said. It's really good stuff. Messianic Jews today that continue to observe Jewish festivals are doing something that's okay since these festivals were given to them, so long as they don't teach others, Gentiles, for example, that it is a necessity. Do you catch that, yeah? The concern is that Gentile believers will go to the opposite, opposite extreme of distancing themselves from the Old Testament, concerned that anything observed from it is legalism. That, of course, isn't true, as I know you'll agree. In fact, even just celebrating Passover points to Jesus. So anyways, that was a little... Uh, a little inside information from a messianic Jew. Thank you, Rob. So last week, Paul, last week we did Paul's testimony and his accre accreditation. Did I say that right? Accreditation as an apostle and the validation of the gospel that he had been preaching for 17 years. And I thought it was really interesting when I was reviewing this yesterday in retrospect. It's interesting that he uses both proof of divine revelation and um, um, the validation uh, from what I, and, and human validation for proofs as well. Sorry, I confused myself a little bit. But remember he says this, the first thing he receives his gospel, he says this, I received it from no man, right? But later on in the chapter he says, but those men, and by the way, he loves to name drop a little bit. Those guys, you know, Peter, James, John, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're kind of a big deal, right, yeah? And he says, they added nothing to my teaching. And then he says, they offered me the right hand of fellowship. And basically, it, he doesn't say this specifically, but it is implied that they validate his gospel message of grace and grace alone, saved by faith, yeah? And then they commission him officially as the evangelist to the Gentiles, right? So it's a full-on... Um, he says, I received the revelation from God, and then it was approved by the elders of the Jerusalem church, and they commissioned me to go on as, a, as the role, in my role as apostle to the Gentiles. Now, another further interesting tidbit that wasn't super obvious um, was Paul's genius in bringing Titus, the Gentile former pagan, with him. And I thought about it more yesterday than I taught last week on it, so I just wanted to go back to it. Because I thought it was really cool. He's a certified pagan convert who's a super committed Christian. And um, it got me thinking about something. Have you ever heard that old theory um, regarding um, nuclear war? That uh, it got floated about uh, probably in the 60s or the 70s. Uh, who was that one author? Kurt Vonnegut. Sounds like a Kurt Vonnegut type of thing, right? Where they should have a law, was how it was proposed, that before a president can push the button to launch nukes, he should be required to kill one of his closest advisors. You get, the, you get the theory behind that? 
In other words, before you launch a missile that's potentially can kill hundreds of thousands of people, to make it more real, right, kill somebody you actually know. Now, I'm not proposing that, just bear with me. It's just an illustration, okay, right? But I got thinking, I thought of that illustration yesterday because what does Paul do? He goes to Jerusalem, right, to meet with the top head honchos of the faith who are in Jerusalem, where my guess is they don't have a lot of pagan converts, maybe not any, actually, you know? And they probably are living in their world of converted messianic Jews, right? And what does Paul do? It's pretty genius if you think about it. He brings an actual, right, Gentile pagan convert who loves the Lord Jesus and is solid in his faith, right? This makes it really difficult to just sort of dismiss, oh, those people. Does that make sense? When you have a living flesh person right there. So I thought that was uh, interesting, and I think I blew, I blew it by it too quickly last week, and I wanted to just come back and emphasize that. I thought that was really cool, the way Paul did that, okay? So I'm not saying he's the only pagan they ever met, but I just thought it was cool, okay? Um, and then the closing point from last week was this, and that is Paul is willing to do whatever it takes to reach people, you know? To a Jew, I became as one as circumcised. To the uncircumcised, I became as one uncircumcised. But, right, he won't budge an inch when it comes to the importance of the gospel of grace and salvation by faith and grace alone, okay? So tonight's verses, uh, we're actually going to, where are we going to go? We're going to pick it up in verse 11, and I think we're only going uh, to do up to chapter 3 tonight. And then it looks like we'll do almost all chapter 3 next week, which interestingly enough will put us halfway through the book. Yeah. Kind of almost sad, yeah? I don't know about you, but I'm not ready for it to be over. But anyways, uh, I only say that in case you're wondering, guys, is this going to take forever? It won't. In about, <laughs> in about four or five weeks, we'll be done with it. So we'll, let's slow down and enjoy it. But I want to share this with you. We have two big time verses tonight. One is kind of a personal favorite because I just love how God always chooses the least likely. It's all through scripture and um, I always keep finding more and more examples of it. And then the other one is a very important teaching um, that echoes real largely in my, uh, in my spirit because uh, it's rooted in my background of uh, where I went to Bible school at Cape and Ray, where my son is right now. Uh, it's a big part of that, and so I'm looking forward to it. In fact, Charles Price, when he preached here two weeks ago, he was teaching on that very thing, and it comes up in one of our verses tonight, so I'm real excited about it. Okay, so we're going to kick off with um, what I call the incident at Antioch. Uh, let's just read the first verse. Uh, we're in chapter 2, verse 11. And this is, to me, this is my first favorite verse of the night. It's almost a comical statement. Okay. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Okay. So just the visual I get right there. Did you all see the email I sent out? Do you remember the movie The Princess Bride? Yeah. And remember the little guy and Andre the Giant? Yeah. And do you remember when he straps the little guy to his stomach so he can pull up the cliffs of... The Cliffs of Insanity. Tom, I knew you'd know that. And you've got this little guy, and he's talking right in Andre the Giant's face. But you should have known that. You da 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 And he's like this little pipsqueak of a guy in Andre the Giant. It's just one of those comments. That's how I picture this. I really picture Paul going, you, you. Now, I don't know. Now, here's the thing. I have no idea if Peter was a big guy and Paul was a small guy. Although there is some sort of evidence that Paul was sort of short. Yeah, yeah that's, that, there is some historical evidence. So, um, but but it's, it's more than just a size thing. And that's my point. But I'm going to get to that in a second. First, I want to give you a little background. What, Antioch. What's the big deal with Antioch? Antioch's a really big deal. Here's why. It is in modern day Turkey. So it's in the south section of Turkey, just north of Syria. But at this time, it was part of what used to be Syria. It was a Syrian province, but of course Rome at this time owns everything, right? But this is what's interesting about it, uh, and this is all according to, um, I think it's Acts uh, chapter 11. Um, it, uh, the Romans conquered it, then it became a large and flourishing colony offering an immediate field for Christian teaching, and the cosmopolitanness of the city tended to um, widen the outlook of the Christian community 
which refuses to be confined within the narrow limits of Judaism. Now, I just kind of read that from, uh, that was a quotation from one of the commentaries. Uh, Antioch was also called the cradle of Gentile Christianity. Antioch was the cradle of Gentile Christianity. But here's what I want to read you. This is from, I'm paraphrasing Acts chapter 11 right here. But this is what happened. Jewish Christians who were persecuted in Jerusalem were fleeing to Antioch, which was a flourishing, Jew, mostly Jewish city far north of Jerusalem, actually in what used to be Syria right there. Yeah. So they were fleeing up, fleeing to Antioch, but it was much more of a cosmopolitan city than Jerusalem was. And so they send Barnabas there, okay, because you have uh, Jews who become Christians are fleeing to Antioch, but there's nobody there to shepherd them. So the Jerusalem guys send Barnabas up there, and he sends for Paul, who's in Tarsus, right? And they both together start doing ministry in Antioch. Most of you, if you know your Bible trivia, you know that it was at Antioch where they were first called Christians. Christians, right, okay? And it is from Antioch where they actually are commissioned to lead their first missionary journey, okay? So Antioch is kind of a big deal. Now, it's not clear in the timeline, and I went down a little bit of a bunny trail and gave up. It's not clear in the timeline when this event with Peter takes place, okay? Was it between missionary trip two and three or one and two, whatever, this and that. It's not a big deal. But here's, here's why I like this story so much. Okay, it's not, you know, I picture jokingly the size differential between, you know, um, Paul and Andre the Giant, Peter, whatever. But think about this, Peter. You know, I wrote in my notes, OG, original gangster. Peter, right? He was like Jesus's right-hand man leader of the apostles. When everybody didn't know what to do and they looked at Peter, when nobody else would say anything, Peter, you say something, right? He's the rock, right? And I assume he's large in stature. Okay, Peter, like big dude in the faith. Then you have Paul, think about it, newcomer, right? Never walked around with Jesus and the rest of the crew, right? A Pharisee, who basically are like the bad guys of the New Testament, right? The, I put they fo the foil of the Gospels, right? A former persecutor of the church, and let's just assume he was small in stature. So here's the thing. I, well, let's read it again. I opposed him to his face. Two things I think about. First of all, the audacity of Paul, right? But the insight into his passion... For, for grace over legalism and also the conviction of his faith and the conviction of the message that God gave him. Paul's got a lot of audacity, but here's the next thing I want to say. The audacity of God, right? To give this to Paul, the least likely. And I love this, yeah? Because by worldly measures, by worldly standards, Peter goes, who the heck do you think you are, pipsqueak in the faith, out of my sight? Do you know who I am? Right? But things don't work that way in the kingdom, do they? Yeah? And so you go all through the Bible. God's always picking the least likely. You know, Moses, be my mouthpiece. Moses is like, I can't do that. You know, right? You know? Uh, don't you have, is that it? You're out of sons? Well, we've got this runt, but it's David. Yeah, right? You know? And on and on. And I, even like, you know, he says to Peter, you'll be the rock. And Peter's the most emotional out of all the guys, right? He's the least rock-like, yeah? And on and on and on, right? So I love this, yeah? And so um, I oppose him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. What was he wrong about? Okay, so let's pick it up, verses 12 and 13. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate. Remember, remember those words. Draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. And the other Jews joined him in the hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. You seeing the problem now? Okay, makes sense, right? First of all, um, it's peer pressure and legalism, which always seem to go hand in hand in life, don't they? Like what is, legalism is almost no fun without peer pressure, right? 
I always say more fun with legalism, but you got to have people around to be legalistic with or it's no fun. Anyway, okay, a couple things here. When it says eat with the Gentiles, uh, a lot of people think it likely means not only was he eating with the Gentiles, but he was also eating forbidden food, right? Which, of course, um, I already wrote in my notes, but it's going to come up again. Remember the, illustra- uh, the story of uh, Peter on the rooftop and the sheet that comes down. Uh, this is before all the missions all started and everything like that. And it, it's, the sheet is full of unclean animals. Peter has a... Sorry, if I'm getting ahead of you and you don't know what I'm talking about... At one time in the, in the book of Acts, at the very beginning of the book of Acts, before Paul, before the missions and all that, Peter is sleeping on the roof of a house in Joppa, right? Some of us have been to Joppa, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. In Joppa, he's sleeping on the roof of a house, and he has a vision. And in his vision, a sheet is coming down from heaven, and it's full of unclean animals. So what would be in there? Pigs. Nobody else remember it? Shellfish? Lobsters? Yeah, okay, yeah. Unclean food. And he hears a voice from heaven say, Peter, get up, kill and eat. And Peter says, no, Lord, never has that unclean food passed my lips. And God says what? Say it again, Doug. Don't make any, don't call. Anything unclean that I have made clean. clean. And then right after that, it happens three times, two times, three times. Three times sounds more biblical. Let's go with three, yeah. And then there's a knock on the door. Peter wakes up. You like that for some facts? Thank you. Thank you. Somebody laughed at that. And he goes downstairs, and they're like, there's a centurion, a Gentile Roman soldier. Get it? A Gentile. An unclean Gentile that says, he ne- says God says you need to come talk to him. I get chicken skin right there. Talk about an easy mission field that was that day, yeah? So what does he do? He goes, and Cor- it's Cornelius, I believe, right, who, who accepts Christ that day. So, okay. So Peter, right, who has been given this vision by God, I'm going to assume some years later, my guess is three to five, seven years, maybe even 17, depending on how long. Anyways, he's there in Antioch eating with the Gentiles and very likely eating unclean food when these guys, it says from James. What does that mean? From Jerusalem, from from the mothership, right? They show up and then look what he does. He begins to draw back and separate himself. We're going to come back to those words a little bit later in the study tonight, yeah? Draws back and separates himself, right? From peer pressure. We all know what's going on here, yeah? But you can tell what probably really angers Paul is others begin to follow his example, including even Barnabas. Now, it says they were acting with hypocrisy. Most of you know this already. The word hypocrisy simply means acting, putting on a fake face um, that doesn't recognize who we really are, masking who we really are. And already you can see the, um, the danger. Now, remember this, too. We know from Paul's other writings that the unity of the Jew and the Gentile was super important to Paul. In fact, I, I think I wrote in my notes. I didn't, I didn't write it down. But almost the whole second chapter of Ephesians is just on that subject right there. So I'm going to read you two verses from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. For he himself, Jesus, is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside, ooh, look at that, setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. And his purpose was to create in himself, separate from the law, in himself, in Jesus himself, one new humanity out of two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. And it's not the only place in Scripture where Paul writes about the importance of Jew and Gentile being one. And now he's seeing division based on legality of the law that Christ died to fulfill, basically, right? Okay, in fact, if anything, I've been quoting this as a John Calvin quote for years or since the last time I taught on Galatians, which has been years. I was wrong. It turns out it's Martin Luther. But Martin Luther said this. He makes a bold claim about this, that God is preserving the entire church through Paul at this moment. In other words, this is what he said. And I read his full quote once, and I just paraphrase it. It says something like, like, Paul alone was the bulwark against legalism seeping back into the faith by taking a stand. Now you see what a big deal it is to who? 
Peter, right? Who Peter, I mean, I know James is in charge of the church in Jerusalem, but I think we could make a good case that Peter's the main guy, right? The rock, right? Yeah? And taking a stand for grace. Okay, so big stuff going on here. And by the way, I also wrote in my notes, we should also be encouraged, actually, that it's Peter who stumbles here. Poor Peter, always putting his foot in his mouth, yeah, all, in all different kinds of ways, yeah? But um, remember, Peter himself had valiantly defended salvation by faith himself before. So it's not like this was a new concept for Peter. He just slipped. It was like peer pressure, and he stumbled, and he fell, and he lost sight of the bigger thing. And Paul corrects him. And it's interesting because I thought, gee, I never really thought to look to see what Peter's reaction was. It doesn't say anywhere. But I think we can safely assume Peter was humbled by this and repented of this. I'm just assuming that. Anyways, yeah? So it's a great lesson that no matter who you are, you can always be susceptible to peer pressure. And it also shows how powerful the pull of the law is on the guys like Peter. In fact, I want to pause here for a second. I like to do this a lot, which is can we just have a moment of grace even for the Judaizers, even for those, because you've been raised in this law your entire life. And if you think that was an easy thing to give up, boy, you don't know people. People hate change. <laughs> if you showed up next week and we did Sunday service different, oh, we'd never hear the end of it, yeah? Now, I was going to think of an example, but I couldn't think of anything silly. Anyways, okay. So, verse 14. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? So Peter had apparently been living as a Gentile before these guys showed up from Jerusalem. And um, I was, uh, some, one commentator said, try to imagine Peter living in this sort of like newfound freedom from the law or whatever. Um, but Paul seems to be saying that he was regressing because it, through his actions, he was teaching the Gentiles to live um, like Jews, right? Um, oh, look at this. I, I found a Martin Luther quote. I didn't realize I had put this in there. I'm just going to read you Martin Luther's quote on this. No one except Paul had his eyes open. Consequently, it was his duty to reprove Peter and his followers for swerving from the truth of the gospel. It was no easy task for Paul to reprimand Peter. To the honor of Peter, it must be said that he took the correction. No doubt he freely acknowledged his fault. The person who can rightly divide law and gospel has a reason to thank God. He is a true theologian. I must confess that in times of temptation, I do not always know how to do it. Isn't that interesting, yeah? And it's kind of true. Now, what would Martin Luther maybe be talking about uh, to, to deviate between law and gospel? Well, I'll give you a good example. Everybody in this room probably pretty much accepts the Ten Commandments, right? But that is Old Testament law, right? I remember, this is now, I'm going off the top of my head, but Tom, you were there for this. I remember in the early 90s at KCF when we were at Rainbow Plaza, all the kids started getting tattoos. Oh, you remember this controversy? It became a really big deal in the church. And so somebody, you know, busted out, what is it, Ex or Leviticus 19.11 or something, you know, thou shalt ha put no mark or tattoo on thy body. Now, that seems pretty straightforward, right? Only one small problem. The verse right above that, it says, men should also never cut their ringlets nor shave their beards. <laughs> you get my point, right? Show me your tattoo and I'll show you my ringlets, right? Where do you divide the line? And the answer is simple. Doug, go ahead, tell us what that's simple. I'm just kidding. No, no, no. I'm being facetious. It's not simple. We have the Old Testament law, we have, but I get it. There's, you know, there's moral law, there's ceremonial law. It's, it's not as complicated as, and it's not impossible. But I thought that was kind of a little bit of humility from Martin Luther when he said, he is a true theologian who can rightly divide gospel and law, and I myself don't know that I always get it correct, okay? So that's Martin Luther having a little bit of grace uh, for Peter. And so what Paul's going to do right now is sort of uh, unpack the, the law again and speak about it, but I think I've talked for a pretty long time. So let's stop for a second if anybody has any questions 
or comments so far? You comment. But at this point, like Paul, is, to, to your point, Paul is fully on board with salvation by grace, right? By faith and by grace and grace alone. And everybody else is still like, you know, I think so, right? You know, that's the old Bob. You guys don't remember Bob the Builder because he didn't have small children. Like, I, can we fix it? Yes, we can. And remember the one guy, Dumpy, says, oh, I think so. Remember that guy? Yeah. yeah. Can we fix it? Yes, we can. Oh, I think so. Right? That's kind of me. Like, yeah. Well, right? And that's what Peter's doing. Yeah, grace. Because Peter, if you go back to read Acts chapter 15, he preaches. We are saved by faith and faith alone. Oh, but now Judaize, you know, oh, my Jewish friends from Jerusalem, and maybe I should, you know, I don't want to call it, you know, I, you know yeah? And Paul's like, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, any, oh, yes, Tom. Tom, 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 two. Oh, three. Three. Oh, you're three? One, two, three. Yeah, Tom, three. Yeah, let's get that right. <laughs> I love that. Uh, Tom just wanted to reiterate, I'm going to reiterate for the camera, that Peter makes a lot of mistakes, and I'm greatly encouraged by that. I love that. I love that about Peter because I think we can all go, oh, well, if even Peter, you know, doesn't get it. I mean, I mean we, we've talked a lot about legalism in this class over the years. And, you know, my, my favorite example, because it's right here, is, you know, not putting my Bible on the floor. You know, Rick did that just the other day. Walked up into my office. My Bible was on my chair. He reaches over, puts my Bible on the floor. I'm like, <laughs> you know? And I'm sorry, but if you never heard the story, I don't want to tell the whole story for the whole crew all over again. But... I'm a legalist when it comes to my Bible. And, you know, the funny thing is, is I can put my Bible right behind me, right here, right now, as long as I'm sitting here. But if I get off the stool and I stand up on the diocese here, I got to pick my Bible up. More fun with legalism. And I expect all you peers to peer pressure me into it, all right? Because that's how legalism works, right? Okay. All right. Yes, Margo. Um, when I read from my notes, it's the new NIV, and when I read from my Bible, it's the old NIV. Stood condemned, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, condemned is actually the better translation, and the reason why they softened it in the NIV is because it doesn't mean condemned to hell, it just means like convicted wrong, basically, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep going because, uh, yeah, good time. we're actually doing pretty good on time, okay. So let's go ahead and pick it up in verse uh, 15. Um, we who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. By the way, uh, so I, I like this idea. Oh, by the way, I, um, I, you know, I just noticed something, and I, I should have pointed this out before I read it. But um, you know, as Bible, whenever you study the Bible, you look for repeated words. So let's read it again. We who are Jews by birth and not Gentiles, so does know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by Faith in Christ. Yeah, three times in like one sentence. Boom, boom, boom. Faith, faith, faith. Okay. Um, J. Mack said this. Johnny Mack said this. By saying as Jews, he was indicating that this. I like this. This is my favorite comment about this verse right here. We of all people, we know what it's like to live by the system of law. We know the law as a way of life, what it is to function continually under the demands of religious rituals and regulations. Yet even we were saved by faith, believing in Christ Jesus, not by the law. And if we as Jews cannot be saved by the law, how can we expect sinners from among the Gentiles to be saved by law? It's pretty good logic, isn't that? I thought, that was, I thought the best explanation of what Paul was saying in there. And so he says it three times. Now, Paul also talks about this uh, in the book of Romans, chapter 4, verse 13. He says, it was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. Now, by the way, it sounds like a really obvious statement, 
But you got to do the math on that. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise. How do we know that? There was no law. <laughs> we forget sometimes, don't we? Because sometimes I have to be reminded of that. Oh, yeah. Abraham didn't have the law. He was saved by faith. Abraham believed God and it was credited as righteousness, right? Yeah. And so um, this verse is perhaps one of the most forceful statements on the doctrine of salvation by faith alone as can be found in all of Scripture. And I really like the way Paul says, we too, in verse 16. So we too, us Jews, us also, yeah? Um, um, and the addition of, oh, it says, uh, and no, because, um, oh, it says, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. But the Greek word actually there is no flesh. Yeah. No flesh will be justified by the law. Now think about that. Yeah. That's a pretty universal. Right. No meat. Right. Will be justified by law. That means every soul on the planet has only one shot at salvation. And it is by faith and faith alone, not religious stuff. And I say religious stuff because since that word says all flesh, let's broaden it out. That means any kind of weird pagan rituals and I hope I don't insult anybody, but crystals and da 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 things, stuff you can do, you know, whether you're sacrificing goats, chickens, or I remember throwing a Twinkie over the cliff at Scorpion Bay hoping it would bring waves, but <laughs> that's kind of an out there example right there, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, we, were, we had been living on the point for three weeks and we were dividing everything exactly down the middle. So each of us got like 15 Pepsis, each of us, you know what I mean? Each of us got 10, you know, chocolate chip cookies, but we had given a ding dong to one of our Mexican friends who lived in the village and that left us with one ding dong. So who gets the ding dong, right? Well, we hadn't had any waves in about five days. We had this great idea that if we sacrifice the ding dong to the wave god, no flesh will be justified by religious observance, right? Because the ding dong didn't work, right? But by faith and faith alone. <laughs> What did you say? I should have thrown a Twinkie? Yeah, maybe a Twinkie would have worked. It was a ding dong. Quite frankly, I, quite frankly, you could have, yeah, you could have had the Twinkie. Did I say Twinkie? Yeah. Oh, it was a ding dong. No, it was a, I said Twinkie. Sorry, it was a ding dong. No, I remember because I threw it. It was like a hockey puck, you know. Okay. Okay, so let's keep moving on. Verse 17. If, while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Now, that's a little bit of a complicated sentence, so we're going to come back and explain it. We all, the, the, we all know the answer already. Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I am a lawbreaker. Okay, this is a weird negative argument, and... Um, uh, this defense does not seem to stem from their current situation. This seems to be um, an accusation that was being leveled against them in a general sense on the doctrine of free grace. And remember, Paul writes about this very same thing in the book of Romans. And the accusation is that, oh, well, if you just believe by faith and you don't have to do anything, then that will encourage people to sin more, which is what he means. That does that mean that Christ promotes sin, right? Um, I think I've told you guys this story a million times, but right after I first be, became a Christian, uh, I was trying to share Christ with an old girlfriend of mine, and I remember she said, so you're saying, then I, once you become a believer, you can just sin as much as you want, and it's not a problem. And I didn't have the vocabulary, I didn't have the know-how, I didn't have the understanding to be able to answer that question. But quite frankly, the answer is, can you still continue to sin like crazy and get into heaven? The answer is yes, actually. I highly, highly don't recommend you do that. 
and it is a complete misunderstanding of the concept of being saved and what you're saved from. You're being saved from death, despair, and you know, all the worst things on the planet. The idea that you'd be like, oh great, now I can do more of that is to completely misunderstand righteousness, obedience, grace, faith, um, and, and punishment, right? But technically, yes. So um, you, you might be familiar with this verse from Romans chapter uh, 6, verse 15. Paul says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? What does he say? By no means. And it is actually the same Greek words that is translated here in uh, Galatians as absolutely not. Most of you are probably familiar with that teaching in the Greek that it is like the strongest admonishment, um, you know, negative admonishment that there is available in the Greek. But then it's interesting. Um, the, their implication was, okay, if you abandon the law, then you become a sinner. Therefore, Christ causes you to sin, right? You see their, rever their, their wrong logic. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. And that's why he says, if you rebuild, um, if I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I'm a lawbreaker. Here's what he means. Um, this is Martin Luther again. Should I now once again establish the law and set up the rule of Moses? This is exactly what I should be doing if I would urge circumcision and the performance of the law as necessary, Rob, <laughs> unto salvation. Instead of righteousness and life, I would be restoring sin and death. Does that make sense? Yeah? Just the opposite of that. And then I also found, uh, I've been reading lately this uh, 17th century theologian, I might have mentioned a couple of weeks ago, John Brown. I kind of stumbled against his, uh, stumbled into his uh, Galatians commentary online. And so I've, I found this, he says this, the reference here is plainly to the conduct of Peter, but according to Paul's wisdom, he makes the statement in the way least fitted to hurt or to offend, but to pull down with one hand what we build up with the other is an inconsistency. And this is what Peter was doing, though not aware of it. He preached the doctrine of full and free salvation, which he had defended in the Council of Jerusalem, but his present conduct was in its tendency quite opposed to those exertions. So he wasn't quite frankly doing the classic what? Practice what you preach, right? Yeah, that's, that's where he went wrong. Yeah, and, and, I, and I would agree. I mean, one of the true marks of salvation is to change the way you think about sin. Now, we can't ever judge somebody else's salvation by their own, by their behavior. We don't do that. But, um, you know, one of the ways, ways I hear, I've heard it put is if you add up all the promises in Ephesians chapter 1, it's pretty hard to argue that somebody would be saved and you would see no life change whatsoever, right? Um, and by the way, I love that idea of being a slave to righteousness because righteousness is freedom. And so true freedom comes from your obedience under Christ uh, because he is perfectly free. And to allow him to live out his life through you is to live a life truly free. It's being set free from the slavery of sin, which is exactly what, in fact, good timing because that's actually where we're going right now. So let's just go there. But good, good point. Okay, verse 19. Um, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. Um, okay, if a, if a man is convicted of a capital crime and he's put to death, then the law no longer has any claim on him. Did you catch that? Okay, if a, if a man is convicted of a capital crime and he's put to death, the law obviously has no more claim on him. So through the law, I died to the law, right? I have died with Christ. I have died. The law no longer has dominion over me because I died to it, which reminds me of a, a great movie concept. Do you guys remember that movie where the guy um, gets framed for a murder and he serves the full 10 years or whatever? But the guy that framed him for the, the, the guy that he was supposed to have murdered was still alive. That was the guy that framed him, right? So the twist of the movie is when he gets out of jail, he tracks the guy down and kills him. <laughs> and they arrest him and he says, you can't arrest me. I've already served my time. 
for killing him, and they let him go. Double indemnity. Double indemnity. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So if we have died in Christ, we are no longer under the law. This is what it means to have died to the law, right? It's a, it's, okay? But here's the best part. If I die, we go to verse 20, and this is the second really important verse for tonight. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Wow. Chicken skin moment. Maybe the most powerful verse you're going to come across this week at least. Right there. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ is living his life out through me. Now this is a major, major teaching. This is a, uh, one of the most important teachers of teachings of the major Ian Thomas, who founded Cape and Ray Bible School. He wrote a book called The Indwelling Life of Christ, or subcategorized as Christ in Me. And I just want to read you one quote from the book. Although Jesus Christ was himself the creative deity by whom all things were made, as man he humbled himself. He set aside his divine prerogatives and he walked this earth as a man. A perfect demonstration of what God intended man to be. The whole personality yielded to and occupied by God for himself. This is how we are supposed to be living as Christ in us. Now I want to show you something. I want to make, yeah, we got time. I want to show you something that I know I've taught some of you maybe many of you, many times. But I just want to explain something to you from Romans chapter 6. So if you turn to Romans chapter 6, there's a really interesting word um, that when I first discovered it, it totally explained the relationship of our sinful nature to our redeemed soul, the life that Christ is living out through us. So if you go to Romans 6, go to verse 1. Here we go again. What shall we say then? Romans 6. What shall we say? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. There's that word again. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So that's, that's what we symbolize when we go under the water. It is a, it is a being buried with Christ, right? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too, here we come up out of the water, may live a new life. And that is the life of Christ in us. Now here's the, here's the catch. Um, verse 5, if we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in, the, in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be, and my version says done away with. What does yours say? Done away with. Okay, you should underline done away with. Bingo. And that is the correct translation. Rendered powerless. Now, why is that so important? The reason why that's so important is we still carry this flesh about with us. This is when we have the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh, when we are being tempted, what have you. We still carry this sinful nature. This is the, this is the old man, okay? So Paul has a couple different terms he calls us. He calls the old man, the fleshly nature, and the new man is the new renewed life of Christ within you, right? He also calls the inner man and the outer man. The outer man, well, first of all, he says, I think it's uh, in chapter 6, uh, maybe even chapter 7, he says, the inner man delights in God's law because the law is not a threat to purity, perfect righteousness, right? right? Delights in the law. He also says, I think it's in Philippians, um, the, old, the, the outer man is decaying daily while the inner man is being what? Renewed daily and it's this beautiful picture of sanctification and ron to your to your point ron about the changed life and that is as we allow christ to live his life out through us seeking out his his righteousness and being obedient to the christ-like life right 
I, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir in this because most of us in this room are over 50, right? So hopefully you've got some years behind you in the faith. You see how your life changes. Those old habits, be, they lose their power, right? They don't have that same power over you. As you learn and you become more free, you get closer to Christ. You also become more cognizant, I think, of your sin as you get closer to Christ, yeah? Usually the most righteous men I know have the least opinion of themselves, right? But that inner man begins to take over, inner man or inner woman, however I should say, yeah? Um, look what Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 to 10. Don't lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and you've put on the new self, which is being renewed, and I love this, in the knowledge, in the in knowledge, in the image of its creator. I love that. As we seek out his life and live like Jesus. And then um, in Romans chapter 7, he says, So my brothers and sisters, you died to the law. You died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might, and I love this, bear fruit to God. And um, uh, how much credit does Paul take for this new life? None. He credits it all to Jesus. He says this, who loved me, at the end of, uh, we're back in Galatians, at the end of verse 21, who loved me and gave himself for me. Gave, there's that word. I, I should have looked up in the Greek. I'm sure it's charis, yeah? Graced. Great, who gifted himself for us. It's a gift. Okay, and the last verse for tonight, um, I told you it was sort of related to what Peter did uh, up in verse uh, 12, I think it was. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. That's a really interesting thing. But look what he said. I don't set aside the grace of God. What did Peter do? He began to draw back and separate himself, right? In a legalistic sense. And Paul says, don't do that. Don't separate yourself from grace. Don't separate yourself from others, right? Because if, if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ's death is for nothing. Now, it's kind of a logic statement here um, that seems logical. If righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. But it might surprise you how many people you know live by that very statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah? That they are good enough. Or remember, like I said a few weeks ago, Christ died for the parts of me that aren't perfect, right? You know? Or, or like I always joke around, um, I don't know where I heard this the first time, but I'm in the 5149 club. You know what that is? I'm 51% good. You just got to be better than 50% good, right? You know, as long as you're more good than that or whatever. Um, you know, someone very close to me one time years ago said, well, tell me what you believe and I'll tell you what I believe. And I gave him the Christian gospel. And he said, well, I believe God gave me a set of standards to live by. And I've lived by those standards. And I said, well, just so you know, that's great. But you know, that's not Christianity, right? That's not faith. Our gospel tells us we have fallen far short of the standard of the glory of God, right? And if, if I have lived up to God's standard, there's no need for grace. There's no need for Christ, right? Okay. So um, interesting that Paul sets himself aside uh, for, or, or I said, interesting that Peter set himself aside for legalism and, and Paul says, um, don't set aside grace. Okay, and then I'll, I'll wrap up with this concluding thought. It's as if Paul was saying to Peter, do you remember when Jesus said, I must be handed over to the elders where I will be tortured, killed, buried, and on the third day rise again? And what did Peter say? Never, Lord, right? And then how does Jesus respond to Peter? Get thee behind me, Satan, for you have not in mind the things of God, but the things of man, right? Yeah? And this is like Paul calling him on that. If you, if you go back to legalism, then Christ dies for nothing. Then you might as well have prevented him, Peter, from dying on a cross. Does that make sense? You, you got scolded by Jesus then, and you're getting scolded by Paul now, right? To your point, yeah? 
So it's interesting. And again, you know, I thought Martin Luther was very gracious towards Peter and the things he said about Peter. Hey, he, you know, he understood the concept, but living it out. And let's be honest, grace, living out grace is sticky. It's difficult. And I will tell you this, legalism in a lot of ways is easier, especially if you're a rule keeper. If you're a rule keeper person, people like rules. People like to know where the lines are drawn. And not only can they, they feel safe within the lines, then you can boss other people and keep them in the lines, right? <laughs> Grace gets sticky. You know, Rick always has a saying like, you know, when, when we have an issue in the church, which happens, you know, just every once in a while. <laughs> and somebody's like, we need a policy. And Rick's like, yeah, but you know, every time we have a policy within a month, what do we do? We have an exception for that, per, you know what I mean? Because grace means sometimes you just, you got to be more loving and now you can't, it's hard to just always draw a firm line without somebody, oh, but you're special and that doesn't, okay, well, okay, well, forget the policy and then the policy goes away, right? Yeah. Um, let me wrap up with these thoughts here. Uh, we got five minutes and then uh, if you have questions or comments. Okay. So remember, always remember this, the law is good and we're going to cover a lot of that next week. We're going to be talking about Abraham and the law and how Abraham was saved by faith. Um, the law is good, but when we approach the law with our sinful nature, it brings judgment, conviction, and death. But by sharing the death of Christ who fulfilled the law, we're set free from it, not as a license to sin, but to be free from sin because the law is good and it leads the way to righteousness. So we have two propositions. To live unto the law is to die unto God. To die under the law is to live unto God. These two propositions go against reason. No law worker can ever understand them, but see to it that you do understand them. The law can never justify and save a sinner. The law can only accuse, terrify, and kill him. Therefore, to live unto the law is to die unto God, and vice versa, to die unto the law is to live unto God. If you want to live unto God, bury the law, and find life through faith in Christ Jesus. All right, questions, comments? I'm going to repeat that for the camera and for anybody else that didn't hear. But Suzanne's great point is when you come to faith, you, have, you possess the indwelling Holy Spirit who will bring these things to mind and lead you into righteousness. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I had dinner tonight with Ron, and uh, we were talking about a couple things I can go back to and look at my life. Some things changed overnight, like from the day of my salvation. A couple key things were automatic, and then everything else was very, very slow <laughs> for a long period of time, and I'm still a work in progress. <laughs> I'm, that's good. I'm going to repeat that. I'm going to repeat that, I'm repeat that for, the, uh, for the camera, Ron. Uh, in your life as a believer, you will, what do you say, sin less, but feel more guilty for the sin you do. Yeah. That, that's a perfect description because, yeah, again, yeah, yeah, most people, the closer you get to God, which, by the way, that reminds me, the best example of someone really righteous getting really close to God is from Isaiah chapter 6, which I'm going to be preaching on on Sunday morning this Sunday. So I'm really looking forward to it because it is, it is the best example, I think, personally in the Bible of the real result of a sinful man encountering actual holiness and so much, ha so much happens in that little interaction with Isaiah and what I believe is a Christophany of Christ on his throne that speaks volumes about um, the nature of our faith and grace and salvation and the message of Christ and the changed life it gives Isaiah that uh, is echoed in our own lives that... Um, if you can't make it on Sunday, um, you're, you're lost. So, no. <laughs> but we're saved by grace. Hopefully, hopefully you're saved by grace because you don't make it to Sunday. Hey, um, Anne, are you ready to come up? Can we, can we bring you up here and lay hands on you and pray, everybody? Um